So yeah, we're reading a book called... Bar yeah, I think it's Baritone. Yeah, it's definitely Baritone. That's what I... I have a... I, had a, a, I guess that's what you'd call my classical singing voice, but I'm kind of all over the place. Um, yeah, there's YouTube. Most of our stuff's on SoundCloud. Um, or Spotify, any of those places. Uh, it's all at We Are Traveler, but Traveler is spelled T-R-A-V-L-R. And then you can always find, like, Carter Banks stuff. Uh, but anyway, so... I'm Carter Banks, and today we're reading Cancer Ward by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. It is his semi-autobiographical novel. Uh, he wrote a book called The Gulag Archipelago, uh, based on his and, like, 300 other people's experience in a Soviet forced labor camp under Stalin. So, this book is uh, what happened to him immediately after played throughout in, uh, I guess, semi-fictitious characters to uh, make him less likely to be thrown in jail, I would guess. But here we go. Chapter 4. The Patient's Worries. For the surgical cases whose tumors were to be arrested by an operation, there was not enough room in the wards on the lower floor. They were put upstairs with the X-ray patients, those prescribed radiotherapy or chemical treatment. For this reason, there were two different rounds upstairs every morning, one for radiotherapists, one for surgeons. The 4th of February was a Friday, operation day, when the surgeons did not make their rounds so Vera Kornelievna Gongart, the radiotherapist on duty, did not start her rounds immediately after the five-minute briefing. She just glanced inside as she passed the door of the men's ward. Dr. Gongart was shapely and not tall. Her shapeliness was emphasized by her narrow waist to which all the contours of her body seemed to point. Her hair, gathered in an unfashionable bun on the back of her head, was lighter than black, but darker than brown. Amajan caught sight of her and nodded to her happily. Kostoglitov also had time to raise his head from his large book and bow to her from afar. She smiled to both of them and raised one finger, as if to warn her children to sit quietly while she was away. Then she moved from the doorway and was gone. Today she was to go round the wards, not alone, but with Ludmila Afansayevna Donstova, Donstova, who was in charge of the radiotherapy department. But Ludmila Afansayevna had been called in to see Nizamuddin Boromovich, the senior doctor, and he was holding her up. Donsova would only sacrifice her x-ray diagnosis sessions on the days she did her rounds once a week. Usually she would spend those two first morning hours, the best of the day, when the eye is at its sharpest and the mind is at its clearest, Sitting with the intern assigned to her in front of the screen, she saw this as the most complicated part of her work, and after more than 20 years of it, had realized what a high price has to be paid, in particular, for diagnostic mistakes. In her department, there were three doctors, all young women. To ensure that they all became equally experienced, and that none of them lagged behind in diagnostic skill, Donsova changed them round every three months. They worked either in the outpatients department or in the x-ray diagnosis room or as house physician in the clinic. Dr. Gangart was at present assigned to the third task, 
the most important, dangerous, and little researched part of it was to check that the radiation doses were correct. There was no formula for calculating the right intensity of a dose, for knowing how much would be most lethal for an individual tumor, yet least harmful to the rest of the body. There was no formula, but there was a certain experience, a certain intuition, which could be correlated with the condition of the patient. After all, this was an operation too, but by rays in the dark and over a period of time. It was impossible to avoid damaging or destroying healthy cells. As for the rest of her studies, the house physician needed only to be methodical, arrange tests on time, check them and make notes on 30 case histories. No doctor likes filling out forms, but Vera Kornilyevna put up with it because for these three months they became her patients, not pale mergings of light and shade on a screen, but her own permanent living charges who trusted her and waited on the encouragement of her voice and the comfort of her glance. And when the time came to give up her stint as the house physician, she was always sorry to say goodbye to the ones she had not had the time to cure. Olympiada Vladislavovna, the nurse on duty, was an elderly, grayish-haired, portly woman who looked more imposing than some of the doctors. She had just gone round the wards telling the radiotherapy patients to stay in their places. But in the large women's ward, it was as though the patients had been waiting for exactly this announcement. One after the other, in their identical gray dressing gowns, they filed onto the landing and down the stairs. Had the old boy come with the sour cream, or the old woman with the milk, they would peer from the clinic porch through the theater window. The lower halves were whitewashed, but through the upper halves, they could see the nurses and surgeons' caps and the bright overhead lamps. Or they would wash their clothes in the sink or go and visit someone. It was the shabby gray dressing gowns of rough cotton, so untidy looking, even when perfectly clean, as well as the fact that they were about to undergo surgery that set these women apart, deprived them of their womanliness and their feminine charm. The dressing gowns had no cut whatsoever. They were all enormous so that any woman, however fat, could easily wrap one around her. The drooping sleeves looked wide, shapeless smokestacks. The men's pink and white striped jackets were much neater, but the women were never issued dresses, only those dressing gowns without buttons or buttonholes. Some of them shortened the dressing gowns, others lengthened them. They all had the same way of tightening the cotton belt to hide their night dresses and of holding the flaps across their breasts. No woman suffering from disease and in such a drab dressing gown had a chance of gladdening anyone's eye, and they all knew it. In the men's ward, everyone except Rusonov waited for the rounds quietly and without much movement. An old Uzbek called Mersalimov, a collective farm watchman, was lying stretched out on his back on his neatly made bed. As usual, he wore his battered old skull cap. He must have been glad about one thing. His cough was not tearing him to pieces. He had folded his hands across his suffocating chest and was staring at one spot on the ceiling. The dark bronze skin of his skull-like head was tightly stretched. The small bones of his nose, the jawbone and the sharp chin bone behind his pointed beard were all clearly visible. His ears had thinned and become no more than flat pieces of cartilage. He had only to dry up a bit more and turn a little blacker and he'd be a mummy. Next to him, Egan Berdiev, a middle-aged Cossack shepherd, 
was not lying, but sitting on his bed, legs crossed as though he was sitting on a rug at home. With the palms of his large, powerful hands, he held his big round knees. His taut, tough body was so tightly knit that if he sometimes swayed a little in spite of his immobility, it was like the swaying of a tower or a factory chimney. His back and shoulders stretched the pink and white jacket tight, and the cuffs on his muscular forearms were on the point of tearing. The small ulcer on his lip, the reason for his entering the hospital, had been turned by the rays into a large crimson scab that obstructed his mouth and made it hard for him to eat and drink. But he did not toss about, fidget, or shout. He would eat everything on his plate steadily and without fail, and then sit like that for hours, quite peacefully, gazing into space. Further down, in the bed by the door, 16-year-old Dayomka had his bad legs stretched out. He was continuously stroking and lightly massaging the gnawing spot on his shin. His other leg folded up kitten-style, just reading, not noticing a thing. In fact, he read the whole time he was not sleeping or undergoing treatment. In the laboratory, where they did all the analyses, the senior lab assistant had a cupboard full of books. Dayomka was allowed to go there and change his books for himself without waiting for them to be changed for the whole ward. Now he was reading a thick magazine, bluish cover. Not a new one, but tattered, faded copy. There were no new ones in the lab. Girls covered. Proshka, too, had made his bed properly without hollows or wrinkles and was sitting quietly and patiently with his feet on the floor like a man in the best of health. In fact, he was quite healthy. He had nothing to complain about in the ward. He had no external sign of disease, and there was a healthy tan on his cheeks. A smooth lock of hair lay across his forehead. He was a fit young man, fit enough even to go dancing. Next to him, Amajdan had found no one to play with, so he had placed a chessboard diagonally across his blanket and was playing checkers against himself. Yefrem, his bandage encasing him like a suit of armor, his head immobilized, was no longer stomping along the corridor spreading gloom. Instead, he had propped himself up with two pillows, two pillows, and was completely absorbed in the book which Kostoglitov had forced upon him the day before. He was turning over its pages so slowly one might have thought he was dozing over it. Azovkin was suffering exactly as he had been the day before. Quite probably, he had not slept at all. His things were scattered. Uh, there's an asterisk at the bottom of this page as it pertains to bluish cover, magazine with a bluish cover. Uh, apparently, Novi Mir, the famous liberal monthly in which the author's works are normally published, he deliberately does not name it, although its identity would be quite clear to any educated Russian. Okay. So that's something that, since we're not educated Russians, uh, now we know. It is now clear. Back to the book. His things were scattered over the windowsill and the bedside table, and his bed was all rumpled. His forehead and temples were covered in perspiration, and his yellow face reflected the pain writhing inside him. Sometimes he stood on the floor, bent double, leaning his elbows against the bed. At other times, he would seize his stomach in both hands and fold his whole body around them. For many days, he had not even answered the questions people asked him. He said nothing about himself. He used his powers of speech only for begging extra medicine from the nurse and doctors. When people came from home to visit him, he would send them out to buy more of the medicines he had seen in the hospital. Yeah. 
We are not educated Russians. I'm not even Russian, so. Over the wind. Oh. I'm going to try and down this coffee real quick. Outside, it was a gloomy, still colorless day. Kostoglotov came back from his morning x-ray, and without asking Pavel Nikolaevich, opened a small window above his head. The air he let in was damp, but not cold. Pavel Nikolaevich was afraid of his tumor catching cold. He wrapped up his neck and sat down by the wall. How dumb they all were, how submissive, wooden almost. Except for Azovkin. Nobody really looked as if he was suffering. They were not really worthy of recovery. It must have been Gorky who said, the only people worthy of freedom are those prepared to go out and fight for it every day. As for Pavel Nikolaevich, already that morning he had taken certain resolute steps. As soon as the registrar's office was open, he had telephoned home and told his wife what he had decided during the night. Applications were to made... were to made through... Oh, wow. This is a uh, misspelling. There's a word omitted here. It's supposed to be applications were to be made through all possible channels. Applications were to be made through all possible channels. He must be transferred to Moscow. He would not risk staying and dying in this place. Kappa knew how to get things done. She must already have set to work. Of course, it was sheer weakness. He shouldn't have been afraid of a tumor and stooped to taking a bed in a place like this. Nobody would ever believe it. But it was a fact, and that, since three o'clock yesterday afternoon, no one had even come to feel whether the tumor had grown bigger. Nobody had given him any medicine. Assassins in white coats. That was well said. They just hung up a temperature chart for idiots to look at. The orderly hadn't even come in to make his bed. He had to do it himself. My word, our medical institutions need a great deal of smartening up. There's an asterisk next to, that was well said. It says this was the standard phrase applied to the accused in 1953, doctor's plot, Stalin's last great purge. Okay. All right, so this guy's probably a... Uh, guy that worked for Stalin, I would assume. At last, the doctors appeared, but they still wouldn't enter the room. They stood over there for quite a while on the other side of the door, round Sibgatov, who had bared his back and was showing it to them. Meanwhile, Kostoglatov had hidden his book under the mattress. Finally, though they came into the ward, Dr. Donsova Dr. Gangart and a poorly gray-haired nurse with a notebook in her hand and a towel over her arm. The entry of several white coats all at once always brings with it a wave of attention, fear, and hope. And the strength of these feelings grows with the whiteness of the gowns and caps and the sternness of the faces. The sternest and most solemn of all was that of the nurse Olympiada Vladislavovna. For her, the morning rounds were like divine service for a deacon. She was a nurse for whom the doctors were of a higher order than ordinary people. She knew that doctors understood everything, never made mistakes, and never gave wrong instructions. She jotted down every instruction in her notebook with a sensation almost of joy something the young nurses no longer had. But even after they were in the ward, the doctors made no undue haste toward Rusanov's bed. Lodmila Afansayevna, a heavy woman with simple, heavy features, her hair already ashen but well-trimmed and waved, said a quiet general, Good morning, and then stopped by the first bed, by Deomka. She peered at 
him searchingly. What are you reading, Dayomka? Can she think of anything more intelligent to say? She's meant to be on duty. Dayomka did not name the title. He did what many people do, turned over the magazine with the faded blue cover and showed it to her. Donsova narrowed her eyes. Oh, it's such an old one. It's two years old. Why? There's an interesting article, said Dayomka, with a significant air. What about? About sincerity, he replied, even more emphatically. It says literature without sincerity. He was lowering his bad leg onto the floor, but Ludmila Afanasyevna quickly checked him. Don't do that. Roll up your pajamas. He rolled up his trouser leg, and she sat down on the edge of his bed. Carefully, using just two or three fingers, she began to probe gently round the affected part. Vera Kornilyevna leaned against the foot of the bed behind her, looked over her shoulder and said quietly, Fifteen sessions, three thousand rads. Does it hurt there? Yes, it does. And here? It hurts further up, too. Well, why didn't you say so? Don't be such a hero. Tell me when it starts to hurt. She slowly felt around the edges. Does it hurt without being touched at night? Dayomka's face was smooth. There still was not a single hair on it, but its permanently tense expression made him look much more grown up than he was. It nags me day and night. Ludmila Afansayevna and Gangart exchanged glances. But have you noticed if it hurts more or less since you've been here? I don't know. Maybe it's a bit better. Maybe I'm just imagining things. Blood count? Ludmila Afansayevna asked. Gangart handed her the case history. Ludmila Afansayevna flipped through it, then looked at the boy. How's your appetite? I've always liked eating, Dayamko replied grandly. He's on a special diet now, broke in Vera Kornilyevna in her lilting voice, kind-heartedly like a nanny. She smiled at Dayomka, and he smiled back. Transfusion? Gongart asked Dontsova the question quickly and quietly. She took back the case history. Yes, well, what do you think, Dayomka? Ludmila Afansievna gave him another searching look. Shall we go on with the x-rays? Of course we go on. The boy's face lit up, and he looked at her greatly. He thought that the x-rays were to be instead of an operation, that that was what Donsova had meant. What she had really meant was that before operating on bone sarcoma, its activity has to be suggest suppressed by irradiation to prevent the formation of secondaries. Again, Bardiev had been getting himself ready for some time. He kept a sharp lookout, and as soon as Ludmila Afansayevna got up from the next bed, he stood bolt upright in the passageway, puffed up his chest, and towered soldier-like above her. Donsova gave him a smile, leaned toward his lip, and inspected the scab. Gangart was quietly reading out fingers to her. Yes, yes, very good, she said encouragingly, louder than necessary, as people do when speaking to someone whose native tongue is different from their own. You're making good progress, Egens Berdiev. You'll soon be going home. Amazhen knew what he was supposed to do. He had to translate what she said into Uzbek. He and Egan Bardiev understood one another, although each thought the other was murdering the language. Egan Bardiev gazed at Ludmila Afansayevna. His eyes showed hope and trust, delight even, the delight with which simple souls regard genuinely educated, genuinely useful people. Nevertheless, he raised his hand to the scab and said something. But it's becoming larger. It's grown, Amajan translated. It will all fall off. That's what is meant to happen. 
Donsova was articulating the words. Shit. Sorry, Periscope. And other comp What the hell? Yeah, this is so bizarre. Um... Oh, thanks. I, uh, I listen and read to a lot of Russian novels. Okay, so... Quick fun fact while I'm trying to rearrange all the shit that just fell down. So, like, the first book I read was Cannibal Island. And literally... The book is really fucked up. And it's like, so many people died. Um... And I was taking pictures of the book with my iPad, just like, just like 300 um, pages or something. And literally, during the process of me taking these pictures, somehow, like, out of nowhere, my screen, like, I had a screen, an additional screen for my computer, and it literally... A fan fell off a table into it and just broke it into pieces. And, like, it made no sense to me. And I was like, what the fuck? Uh, there's no way it could have happened, as far as I know. It's like something came across the room and just broke it. And I saw so my screen broke. And I was thinking, like, why? Why? <laughs> it's like, maybe there's a lot of, like, you know, ghosts or something that are like, oh, my God, he's digging up the past. Cannibal Island. That's what I thought. But, you know, it's also a pretty bizarre thing to think. Anyway, so... I will jump cut that all out, but... Thank you, Periscope, for holding on. Basically, what just happened is... My computer monitor shut. Uh, my webcam fell off the computer, and then the Periscope toppled down on top of everything. Um... I don't know how that happened. I wasn't looking, but it doesn't seem like an easy thing to do. Anyway, so I'm going to get back to the book, but uh, here we go. Yeah. Sorry, everyone, on Periscope and the live video. It will fall off. That's what's meant to happen. Don Sova was articulating the words particularly loudly. It will all fall away. Three months. Rest at home, and then you'll be back to us. She went across to the old man, Mersalimov, who was already sitting with his feet hanging down. He tried to get up to meet her, but she stopped him and sat down next to him. The emaciated, bronze-skinned old man looked at her with the same faith in her omnipotence. Through Amazhen, she asked about his cough and told him to lift up his shirt. She felt his chest lightly where it hurt and knocked on it with her fingers. Over her other hand, meanwhile listening to Vera Kornilyevna, telling her about the number of sessions, the blood count, and the injections. Then she silently examined the case history itself. Once upon a time, every organ had been necessary, everything in its place inside a healthy body. But now it all seemed so superfluous, knots of muscles and angles of bone protruding from under the skin. Donsola prescribed some new injections. Then she asked him to point out among the bottles on his bedside table which pills he was taking. Mursalimov picked up an empty bottle of multivitamins. When did you buy these? Donsova inquired. Also, there's an asterisk pertaining to the two guys who are uh, basically translating shittily to each other that says, Amazhen is an Uzbek, Egan Bardiev, a Kazakh. They speak different Turkic dialects. Okay, so it's the same language, just different dialects. Also, when these asterisks start coming up, from now on I'm just going to interject with the asterisk note right after I see the asterisk. I don't know why I wasn't doing that already. Amajan translated two days ago. Well, where are the pills? He'd taken them all. What do you mean? You've taken them all? Donsova was flabbergasted. All at once? No, two different times, Amajan relayed to her. The doctors, the nurses, the Russian patients, and Amajan 
all burst out laughing. Marcelimov bared his teeth. He had not yet understood. Only Pavel Nikolaevich was filled with indignation at their senseless, untimely criminal laughter. Well, he'd soon sober them up. He had been debating which pose to use to confront the doctors. And he had decided his point could be best made in a semi-reclining position with his legs drawn up under him. It's all right, it doesn't matter, Donsova reassured Murselimov. She prescribed some more vitamin C, wiped her hands on the towel so fervently proffered to her by one of the nurses, and turned with a look of concern on her face toward the next bed. Now, as she stood close to the window and facing it, one could see her unhealthy, grayish complexion. There was a very tired, almost sickly expression on her face. Sitting up sternly in bed, bald in his skullcap and glasses, Pavel Nikolaevich looked rather like a schoolteacher, not any old school teacher, but a distinguished one, who had brought up hundreds of pupils. He waited until Ludmila Afonseyevna was quite close to his bed, then he adjusted his glasses and declared, Comrade Donsova, I shall be forced to inform the Ministry of Health of the way things are conducted at this clinic, and I shall have to telephone Comrade Ostapenko. She did not tremble or go pale, but perhaps her complexion became a little more pasty. She made a strange movement with her shoulders, a circular movement, as though her shoulders were tired and longed to be rid of the harness which held them. If you have good contacts in the Ministry of Health, she agreed with him at once, and if you're in a position to telephone Comrade Ostapenko, I can think of several more things you might add. Shall I tell you what they are? There is nothing that needs be added. Your display of indifference is quite enough as it is. I have been in here for 18 hours and nobody is giving me treatment. And I am a... There was nothing more he could say to her. Surely she could supply the rest herself. Everyone in the room was silent, staring at Rusonov. It was Gongart who was shocked, not Donsova. Her lips tightened into a thin line. She frowned and knit her brows, as if she had seen something irrevocable take place, or irrevocable take place, and been powerless to avert it. Donsova, her large frame towering over the seated Rusonov, did not even permit herself a frown. She made another circular movement of her shoulders and said in a quiet, conciliatory tone, That's why I'm here to give you treatment. No, it's too late now, Pavel Nikolaevich cut her short. I've seen quite enough of the way things are done here, and I'm leaving. No one shows the slightest interest. Nobody bothers to make a diagnosis. There was an unintended tremble in his voice. He was really offended. You've had your diagnosis, Donsova said slowly, both hands gripping the foot of his bed. And there's nowhere else for you to go. No other hospital in the Republic will take patients with your particular illness. But you told me I don't have cancer. What is the diagnosis? Generally speaking, we don't have to tell our patients what's wrong with them. But if it will make you feel any better, very well. It's lymphoma. You mean it's not cancer? Of course it's not. Her face and voice bore no trace of the bitterness that naturally comes from a quarrel, for she could see clearly enough the fist-sized tumor under his jaw. Who could she feel bitter against? The tumor? Nobody forced you to come here. You can discharge yourself whenever you like, but remember. She hesitated. People don't only die of cancer. It was like a friendly warning. What's this? Are you trying to frighten me? Pavel Nikolaevich exclaimed. Why are you doing it? That's against the rules of professional etiquette. He was still rattling away as hard as he could, but at the word die, everything had suddenly frozen inside him. His voice was noticeably softer when he added, You, you mean my condition is all that dangerous? 
Of course it will be if you keep moving from one hospital to another. Take off your scarf. Stand up, please. He took off his scarf and stood up on the floor. Gently, Don Sova began to feel the tumor and then the healthy side of the neck, comparing the two. She asked him to move his head back as far as it would go. It wouldn't go very far. The tumor immediately began to pull it back. Next, he had to bend it forward as far as possible, then twist it to the left and the right. So that was it. His head had apparently already lost practically all its freedom of movement. That amazing effortless freedom, which when we possess, it goes completely unnoticed. Take off your jacket, please. His green and brown pajama jacket had large buttons and was the right size. No one would have thought it could be difficult to take off. But when he stretched his arms, it pulled at his neck, and Pavel Nikolaevich groaned. The situation was serious. The impressive gray-haired nurse helped him untangle himself from the sleeves. Do your armpits hurt? Donsova asked. Does anything bother you? Why, might it spread down there as well? Rusonov's voice had now dropped and was even quieter than Ludmila Afanseyevna's. Stretch your arms out sideways. Concentrating and pressing hard, she began to feel his armpits. What sort of treatment will it be? Pavel Nikolaevich asked. Injections, I told you. Where? Right into the tumor? No, intravenously. How often? Three times a week. You can get dressed now. And an operation is... impossible? Behind the question lay an overriding fear of being stretched out on the operating table. Like all patients, he preferred any other long-term treatment. An operation would be pointless. She was wiping her hands on the towel the nurse held out to her. I'm very glad to hear it, Pavel Nikolaevich thought to himself. Nevertheless, he would have to consult Kappa. Using personal influence in a roundabout way was never very easy. In reality, the influence he had was not as much as he might have wished for, or as great as he was now pretending it was. It was not at all an easy thing to telephone Comrade Ostapenko. All right, I'll think about it. Then we'll decide tomorrow? No, said Donsova mercilessly. You must decide today. We can't give any injections tomorrow. It's Saturday. More rules. Doesn't she realize rules are made to be broken? Why on earth can't I have injections on Saturday? Because we have to follow your reactions very carefully, both on the day of the injection and the day after. And we can't do that on a Sunday. So you mean, it's a serious injection. Ludmila Afanseyevna did not answer. She had already moved to Kostoglotov's bed. Couldn't we wait till Monday? Comrade Rusonov, you accused us of waiting 18 hours before treating you. How can you now suggest waiting 72? She had already won the battle. Her steamroller was crushing him. There was nothing he could do. Either we take you in for treatment or we don't. If it is yes, you will have your first injection at 11 o'clock this morning. If it is no, then you must sign to the effect that you refuse to accept our treatment and I'll have you discharged today. But we certainly don't have the right to keep you here for three days without doing anything. While I'm finishing my rounds in this room, please think it over and tell me what you've decided. Rusonov buried his face in his hands. Gengart, her white coat fitting tightly right up to her neck, walked silently past him. Olympiada Vladislavovna followed like a ship in full sail. Don Sova, weary of the argument, hoped to be cheered up at the next bed. Well, Kostoglatov, what do you have to say? Kostoglatov smoothed down a few of his tufts of hair and answered in the loud, confident voice of a healthy man. I feel fine, Ludmila Afanseyevna. Couldn't be better. The doctors exchanged glances. Vera Kornilyevna's lips were smiling faintly, but her eyes... They were fairly laughing with joy. Well, all right, Donsova sat down on his bed. 
Describe it in words. How do you feel? What's the difference since you've been here? With pleasure, Kostoglatov was only too willing. The pain started to go down after the second session. After the fourth, it had gone completely, and my temperature went down too. I'm sleeping very well now, ten hours a night, in any position, and it doesn't hurt. Before, I couldn't find a single comfortable position. I never used to want to look at food, and now I finish everything and ask for second helpings. And it doesn't hurt. And it doesn't hurt, Gongard burst out laughing. And they give you second helpings, Don Sova was laughing. Now, too. Sometimes, but what else is there to say? My whole attitude to the world has changed. When I arrived, I was a dead man. Now I'm alive. No vomiting? No. Don Sova and Gangart looked at Kostoglatov and beamed, just as a teacher looked at a star pupil, and takes more pride in a question excellently answered than in his own knowledge and experience. Teachers become attached to such pupils. Can you feel the tumor? It doesn't bother me anymore. But can you feel it? Well, when I lie down, I can feel something heavy, almost as if it's rolling around, but it doesn't bother me, Kostoglatov insisted. All right, lie down. Kostoglatov went through his routine. During the past month, many doctors and medical students had examined his tumor in various hospitals. They used even to call in colleagues from other rooms to feel it. Everyone had been amazed by it. He lifted his legs onto the bed, drew up his knees, lay on his back without a pillow, and uncovered his stomach. He could feel at once how this toad inside him, his companion through life, had dug itself deep in and was pressing against him. Ludmila Afanseyevna sat next to him. With gentle, circular movements, her hand moved closer to the tumor. Don't tense up, don't tense up, she kept reminding him. He knew he shouldn't, but he still kept tensing himself in instinctive defense, hindering the examination. Finally, having persuaded his belly to relax trustingly, she felt, deep down beside the stomach, the edge of the tumor. Then she went on to feel all round it, gently at first, then more firmly, and then a third time more firmly still. Gangart was looking over her shoulder, and Kostoglatov was looking at Gangart. She was a very likable person. She wanted to be strict, but she couldn't. She got accustomed to her patience so quickly. She tried to be grown up, but that didn't work either. There was something of the little girl about her. I can feel it distinctly, the same as before, Ludmila Afanseyevna announced. It's a little flatter, there's no doubt about that. It's settled a little further in and released the stomach. That's why it doesn't hurt him. It's softer, but the circumference is almost the same. Will you take a look? No, I don't think so. I do it every day. It's better to take a break from it. Blood count, 25. White cells, 5, 8, 100. Sedimentation. There, you can see for yourself. Rusanov raised his head from his hands and asked the nurse in a whisper, The injections, are they very painful? Kostoglatov was also making inquiries. Ludmila Afanseyevna, how many more sessions will I have? We can't decide that quite yet. No, but roughly. When do you think I'll be discharged? What? She raised her head from the case history. What did you say? When are you going to discharge me? Kostoglatov repeated, just as confidently. He gripped his shins with his hands and assumed an independent air. All trace of admiration for the star pupil had vanished from Donsova's gaze. He was now just a difficult patient whose face expressed deep-rooted stubbornness. I'm just beginning to treat you. She cut him short. Starting from tomorrow, up to now, we've only been setting our sights. But Kostoglatov would not give way. Ludmila Afanseyevna, I'd like to explain something to you. I realize I'm not cured yet, but I'm not aiming at a complete cure. 
Well, what a bunch of patients, each one better than the next. Ludmila Afonsayevna was frowning. This time she was angry. Whatever are you talking about? Are you in your right mind? Ludmila Afonsayevna. Kostogotov raised one large hand to wave aside any further accusations. Discussions about the sanity or insanity of contemporary man will take us far from the point. I am really grateful to you for bringing me into this enjoyable state of health. Now I want to make use of it a little and live. But what will happen if I have further treatment? I do not know. While he was speaking, Ludmila Afonsayevna's lower lip jutted with impatience and indignation. Gungart's eyebrows had twitched. She was looking from one to the other, eager to intervene and to pacify. Olympiada Vladislavovna was gazing haughtily down at the rebel. In fact, I don't want to pay too high a price now for the hope of a life sometime in the future. I want to depend on the natural defenses of the organism. You and your natural defenses of the organism came crawling into this clinic on all fours. Don Sova came back with a sharp rebuke. She got up from the bed. You don't even understand the game you're playing. I won't even talk to you. She waved her hand like a man and turned toward Azovkin. Kostoglatov lay there, his knees pulled up under the blanket. He looked implacable, like a black dog. Ludmila Afonsayevna, I still want to discuss the matter with you. You may be interested in this as an experiment in seeing how it will end, but I want to live in peace, if only for a year. That's all. Very well, Donsova threw the words over her shoulder. You'll be sent for. She was now looking at Azovkin. She had not yet been able to switch the annoyance from her face to her voice. Azovkin did not get up. He just sat there holding his stomach, merely raising his head to greet the arrival of the doctors. His lips did not form the whole of a mouth. Each lip expressed its own separate suffering. In his eyes, there was no emotion except entreaty, a plea for help to those who could not hear. Well, Kolya, how are things? Ludmila Afonsayevna encircled his shoulders with her arms. B bad he answered very softly. When he spoke, only his mouth moved. He tried not to expel any air from his chest, because the slightest jolt of the lungs was passed on toward the stomach and the tumor. Six months ago, he had been striding along, a spade over his shoulder, the head of the Young Communists' Sunday working party, singing at the top of his voice. Now he could not raise his voice above a whisper, even when talking about his pain. All right, Kolya, let's think about this together. Donsova was speaking just as softly as he. Perhaps you're tired of the treatment. Perhaps you're fed up with being in hospital. Is that right? Yes. This is your hometown. Perhaps a rest at home would do you good. Would you like that? We can discharge you for a month or six weeks. After that, you'd take me in again? Of course we'll take you in again. You're one of us now. It'll give you a rest from the injections. Instead, you can buy medicine from the chemist and put it under your tongue three times a day. Sinesterol? Yes. Donsova and Gengar did not realize that for months. Azovkin had been frantically begging extra medicine from every duty nurse and night duty doctor. Sleeping pills, painkillers, every sort of extra powder or pill, except those prescribed for him orally or by injection. This reserve supply Azovkin crammed into a little cloth bag, which he kept ready to save himself with on the day when the doctors stopped helping him. You need a rest, my dear Kolya, a rest. It was very quiet in the ward. Rusanov sighed and raised his head from his hands. His words rang through the room. Doctor, I give in, inject me. And that ends chapter four of Cancer Ward by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And I see that Instagram 
has grammed out on us, as I thought it might do. Anyway, thank you all for being here. I'm getting more into this book, and yeah, these names, they're really tough, but at the same time, it's like, they all have the same, like, thing. Like, the root word is always, like, something Yevna or a vich. And it's usually like a three syllable extension. So once you get it down the first time, uh, it's not too hard. Anyway, you know what? Yeah, you're right. It's, it's something weird I noticed that, yeah, they use the. Uh, they use their the, the reason they say like it sounds like they keep saying all these first and last names every time they're talking but like Pavel Nikolaevich for instance is like yeah Pavel son of Nikolaevich his last name's Rusanov so we keep getting confused so i guess his full name would be Pavel Nikolaevich Rusanov i could be wrong about this but it feels right 